so today we are jumping back into uh, this uh, series. Um, last week, Eric preached on meditation as a, as a really an inroad for joy, for happiness, for gladness of heart. And today we're continuing looking uh, at kind of a real specific form, in a way, of meditation, using the word as a, as a means to bring the joy of the Lord's salvation into our life, to overflow uh, with the, the joy of the Lord, and that's preaching the gospel to ourselves, how to, how to preach the gospel to ourselves as a daily habit, as a uh, knee-jerk reaction when we're being discouraged or when joy is being threatened in our life, to have it be second nature to respond to that type of uh, sapping of joy, to, to have the proper response and how to, become, how to have this become a habit for us. Now, if you remember two weeks ago, and I kind of made my, my case for God's desire for our joy and God's desire for our happiness and gladness of heart, for true joy, true happiness, true gladness, uh, I read a, a scripture, Isaiah 52, 7. Uh, it's, it won't be up on the screen because I added this just this morning because I, I thought I should remind us of this. It, it says in Isaiah, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news is the gospel. It's the same word. Gospel is uh, good news. So how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet, the person who brings good news, who publishes or declares peace, who brings good news, the gospel of Happiness. So this is when we saw two weeks ago that the gospel actually is intended to also make us happy in the fact that we are saved from sin and death. That should make us happy. It should make us joy-filled. It should make us glad. It should cause us to celebrate. It should put a smile on our face. It should put laughter in our hearts. This is the gospel of happiness, a gospel of joy, a gospel of peace. So the good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, so how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the person who brings the gospel of happiness. So if you bring the gospel to people, then you will make people happy. You'll make people filled with joy. We need to bring the gospel to people. Now, here's the thing. No human being on this planet has more influence over your life and your attitude and your decisions and your feelings, no one has more influence over your whole entire life than you yourself. Isn't that right? Because you spend the most time with yourself more than anyone else, right? You live with your spouse, you live with your kids, you live with your roommates, but you spend more time with yourself than anyone else on this planet. You talk to yourself all throughout the day, if it's like too much, then you should see a doctor. But you know, like you, you kind of have these conversations with yourself a little bit here and there, right? You, you make decisions. You go to the store. Should I buy this? Should I buy that? You're having a conversation with yourself. Uh, you, you listen to yourself. You, you tell yourself things about yourself or maybe about the circumstance you're in or, you know, why, why are they doing that to me? And, and you, you have these thoughts. You lay in bed at night and you basically talk to yourself or listen to yourself. You, you play back the tape of what happened in the day and you're reminding yourself what happened. You're reminding yourself of what's gonna happen tomorrow and what you have to face and you make your own schedule. You look at your to-do list. You have conversations with yourself all the time. You're listening to yourself every single day, probably every single minute in some form or fashion other than when you sleep. And so if you... Talk to yourself, listen to yourself, have conversations with yourself more than anyone else, then it's important for you not just to be a bearer of the good news of happiness to others, but you also need to be a bearer of the good news of happiness to yourself. All right, if, if, if it's a blessing and if it's beautiful for us to have our feet bring the good news of God's happiness to others, then we are also blessed if we bring the good news of God's happiness to our own selves, since we spend the most time talking to ourselves. So because we have these conversations, I wanna put this to you guys. This is, I wrote in your notes here that we need to learn how to stop just listening to ourselves because that's what we do primarily. We just listen to the thoughts that we have and we're filtering the daily events and the conversations and we're interpreting what people said and, and all these things. We need to stop listening to ourselves and we need to start preaching to ourselves. We need to learn how to really start preaching 
to ourselves what is truth, the truth of Jesus. We, we need that voice that comes from God's word. We need that voice in our minds, in our hearts every single day. And you have the absolute power, responsibility, and ability to make this happen. It's great that we come to church on Sunday. This is something that God has designed for the church to get together on Sundays throughout the whole world. It's great that you read books, and that's an important part, reading books from other godly believers from throughout church history. It's great that you listen to online sermons. It's great that you do all these things, but you need to learn for yourself to preach the gospel to yourself and not always and simply only be dependent on a pastor, a preacher, or an author. We've all got to learn how to do this ourselves because you spend the most time with yourself more than anyone else. We've got to learn how to do this. So I wanna ask a couple questions before we pray and jump into uh, a scripture I think is very um, foundational for this, this thought, but two questions, this is in your notes. First of all, what is preaching? I wanna define what this means, to preach the gospel or preach a message to ourselves. If we're listening to different messages, first of all, what is preaching? Preaching, <coughs> excuse me, it's an attempt to communicate what we believe should filter, color, and shape how we see everything. Okay, so it, it gives uh, shape to how we interpret the world around us. So we, we preach what we believe a proper worldview or perspective should be. Everyone is preaching something, somehow, at some time. Everyone. Right, when you gossip, you're preaching to someone something about someone else. You're trying to convince them of how they should see someone else, right? Okay, when you're lecturing your kids or when you're arguing with your spouse, you are preaching something to them that you want them to be convinced of. That's preaching. It might not be up on a podium like this with a microphone and a group of people, but we're always preaching something. When you go down the road and you see billboards, or when you see advertisements pop up online, they are preaching something to you that they want you to be convinced that you need or something you should desire. Everyone is preaching something, somehow, at some time, and in some way. So, ads, politicians, friends, social media, parents, activists of all sorts, all have a message of something they believe or want you to believe. They might not even believe for themselves, but they just want you to believe it. So this is different than just thinking about facts or circumstances. Uh, it's an attempt to shape hearts, to shape worldview, minds, which would then have follow it actions. First, if the mind is transformed, if the heart's desires are changed and convinced of something we need, then hopefully actions will follow up. Think about advertisements. They wanna convince you first of something that you think, you, they want you to think, I need that, and they hope that you follow up, not just going, yeah, I need that. They want you to follow up with purchasing that thing. Right, politicians first wanna convince your mind that their worldview is correct so that then it would follow up with actions in a vote. So preaching starts with wanting to convince us of something, having our, our minds transformed, our hearts transformed so that we would do something about it. Not just be convinced of facts, but then we should do something about what we just were having preached to ourselves. So whether it is activists or coaches, friends or social media, these people in our lives, these things in our lives, preach to us different things because they want actions to follow once we are convinced of the thing that is being preached. That's what preaching is. Coaches preach, spouses preach, we all preach in different ways. So, the second question, then what are the, the gospels or messages or bits of news? Now, not all these are good news. Some of these are false news, bad news. But what are the different gospels or different types of messages that are being preached? So if we believe preaching that tells us we need more, that's some of the types of preaching that's out there, you need more, you deserve more. Or preaching that tells us we're entitled to some kind of different life, you deserve better than that. That shouldn't happen. You should get revenge. They owe you. You've been wrong, so therefore you need this or a different outcome. Or maybe upon failure, you have some kind of failure in your life, whatever it might be, job failure, family failure, marital failure, relational failure. 
upon some kind of failure, we preach a message to ourselves of condemnation and self-hatred. Oh, you're such an idiot. Why do you keep doing that? You always blow. You always mess up. You always ruin friendships. We, we preach these things to ourselves. Or maybe other people are preaching them to us. Why do you always do that? You always do this. You always make people feel this way. So it could come from other people. It could come from ourselves. We believe a message also of autonomy. It says we don't need other people. We don't need the church. We don't need to be held accountable. We don't need close Christian friends to help us. We, we, we are, you can't judge me. I've got my Bible. You can't tell me how to live. We, we have this, this gospel, quote unquote, of autonomy that says we don't need to answer to anyone, whether it's church or people, friends, spouses, or God himself, as long as we'll feel strongly about our own desires. We become our own God. We dictate our own morality. We dictate our own values. So in other words, different messages from different sources are gonna be preaching to us different lies. Different lies. We need to be able to rightly discern what is truth from the lie. And when we do this, when we learn how to really do this, this is when we have a life filled with joy, and happiness of God, gladness of heart, because we're publishing peace and the gospel of happiness and joy and gladness into our own hearts. And so with that, I'd like to pray and um, we're gonna look at Romans 12, one and two because I think it gives us a good foundational look at why we need the gospel and not just commands to do things, but we need something else first before we just go and do. So let's pray and ask the Lord to, to help us this morning to, to know and believe and be convinced that this gospel of truth really is true. Father in heaven, we uh, approach you this morning knowing that uh, this, this life that we live here, uh, really there's a, a battle going on all over the place and it's a, it's a fight and a war for our worship and for our, uh, for our devotion, uh, for our single-mindedness, for our commitment, our loyalty, and the enemy uh, would desire that we would not be loyal to you and not be committed to you and not believe your gospel, but believe some kind of false gospel that would get us to wander astray and somehow make something else the center of our life. And so this morning, we, uh, we hope and we pray that as we <coughs> get into your word that as your, your word goes into our minds, that it would begin to renew our mind and shape and shift our worldview and our perspective and that we would be convinced that there is no other God like you, that you are the Almighty. You are the King of kings, you're the Lord of lords, the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega. You're faithful and true. You're the God of our salvation. You're the eternal one of Israel. You're the creator of all things. And there is no one and nothing like you. There's nothing on this planet that ever was or ever will be that will be worthy of our worship and our adoration and our praise. There is nothing at all that compares to you. And yet somehow, through the preaching of the world and various means, we go after other things. And we thank you that there is grace for that, that there is forgiveness for that. There's no condemnation as we go after those things, but because there's no condemnation, that should melt our heart and draw us back to you, knowing that you're a loving and gracious Father. So help us to see this, and we, we pray that you would just help us this morning through your Holy Spirit and in your word that you'd convince us, as only your word can. We love you, we thank you, and uh, we're grateful for your word today grateful for your church today. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. In Romans uh, chapter 12, verse one, uh, Paul's writing here to the Roman church and he has this appeal to them. He, he, he's making his case. He's, 
He's begging them in one sense. He says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice. Give yourself to God completely. Holy and acceptable to God. Now, this is your spiritual worship. It's a reasonable sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the world, okay? So we're talking about having the world preached to us in various means and ways. Don't, keep, don't be conformed to that preaching. Don't believe the lies of the world that tell you you need this, you need that. This will make you happy. This will give you joy. This is what you're missing out on. This is how you should uh, do things. This is what you should pursue. This is what makes you a real man. This is what makes you a real woman. Don't be conformed to the, the gospels, quote unquote, of the world. Don't let those things shape your mind, shape the affections and desires of your heart. Don't let those things lure you and woo you away from Christ. Don't be conformed to this world, but rather instead be transformed. Be changed, be converted in your heart. Have your heart and your mind change and transform by the renewal of your mind. That, that tells us something about our mind, that our mind needs something desperately because our mind has been shaped and changed and wired through the preaching of the world to desire certain things that are not of the Lord, that will not actually give us joy, will not give us happiness, will not give us fulfillment or satisfaction. Our minds need to be renewed. They need to be changed. Not just trained, but they need to be transformed. Something radical has to happen in this mind, in this heart. Something radical, something new has to happen. It's not just duct taping things together. It's not just trying new tactics. It's not just trying new disciplines or doing this or doing that. There's a transformation that has to happen on the inside that human hands cannot do, that certain disciplines and self-will and, and your own self-control cannot do. Renewal has to happen in the heart. This is why when in the word of God, when it says, when God says to circumcise your hearts, the people were like, how do we do that? If we circumcise our hearts, we'll die, right? You take a scalpel and circumcise your heart, we'll die. And the Lord's like, that's the point. You can't do it. Only I have the power to change your hearts. This is what we need, church. We need a transformation of the hearts, the renewal of our mind, and that by testing, so when our mind, when our hearts are renewed and transformed, through the testing of it, the renewed heart, then we will discern, we'll be able to know what is the will of God. How many of you guys would love to know what the will of God is for your life? Only one, wow, okay, I'll be the second one, okay. We all, everyone wants to know what the will of God is for our life, and he says, you wanna know what the will of God is? Don't be conformed to the preaching of the world, but rather be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing, then you'll be able to discern what the will of God is for you, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You'll be able to see clearly in life. You'll know this is God's will. This is his desire. You won't be confused and tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine, every feeling and emotion that comes to pass. You'll be able to see things clearly with perspective, a proper worldview, because God has renewed your mind. You want that? Because I want that. I want that. So to be this living sacrifice for God, we need more than just being told what to do. That's, that's religion right there. And we like that. We like checklists and boxes and just do this, do this, do this, and you're good. But it's more than that, church. And you know what? I'm thankful it's more than that because there's not enough checklists for us to check off. Well, you can checklist and checklist and do, 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 and it'll never, ever, ever be enough. So I'm glad that it's not that. Even though there's something about us that likes that. We like the pat on the back. I mean, how many of you guys, you guys are checklist people, you get through the day, you check them all off, and you're like, you give yourself the pat on the back. It feels good, right? That's why we like our 
to be that way too, but this is not how it is with the Lord. We sang the song today. It's already finished. The checklist is complete. There's no deed. There's no right or magic word. There's no penance to complete. You don't gotta pay for the sins of your past. There's no penance, church. It's done, it's finished. So now we need to have our minds renewed so we can live as a living sacrifice because the checklist has been done for us. And this is good news. So when we just have this thing, this happens a lot where if you're maybe in a friendship or a relationship or in a marriage or with your kids, and this is important, this, this applies in every relationship. How many times have you sinned, failed, and then you have a friend who with a very good intention and good heart just says, you know what you need to do? You just need to trust the Lord. You know, you're worried about something. They say, you just need to trust the Lord. You know what I think to myself? Thanks, I already know that. Great advice. Tell me something I don't know. And they're well-meaning. How many times have you done that to someone? You know, or, or, or when your friend commits sin, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's some kind of uh, thing. Maybe it's uh, pornography or if it's lying to someone or something like that. And then you just say, you know, you just need to stop. Like, <laughs> Tell me something I didn't know. Like, I already know that. You're telling me, do you think, I can't stop, that's the problem. Tell me how to stop. You just, so when we say things like, if you ever start your sentence with someone with, you just need to, dot, 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 what you're doing now is you're just preaching the law to them. You're just telling them what they need to do in their own strength. You just need to trust God. Okay, the problem is, I'm, I'm a sinful, frail, weak person. Tell me how to trust God. I need my heart to change because I can't trust God right now. I need my heart to change because I still desire that sin. Tell me how, tell me how my heart can change so I don't want to do that thing any longer. Don't just tell me what to do, I already know what to do. This is why Paul said, I, everything I want to do, I don't do, and everything I don't do, I want to do. He's like, who is gonna free me from this body of death? He says, I thank God it's through Jesus Christ. It's not through our own willpower and through our own self-discipline. We already know what is right and wrong. That's not the problem. So we don't need people telling us, you just need to do this. I already know what I need to do and what I don't need to do. Tell me how. Tell me how my heart can change so I don't desire those things anymore. Tell me how my heart can be renewed so that I do desire the things of the Lord more than the things of the world. Tell, tell me how my heart can change so I love the preaching of the gospel and I hate the preaching of the world. Tell me how I cannot be conformed by the worlds. That's what we need, church. We need a renewal of the mind, not being told what to do. Now, is there a place in discipleship and in accountability where we need to have challenges and things? Yes, absolutely, but they should never be alone. You should never be in a conversation where you're just telling people what to do and what they're doing wrong. You should always have the reason why, the because for the therefore. Because of this gospel truth, and therefore, friend, this is why you can go do this, because of God. All right, and that's what we're gonna look at today primarily is how to have this kind of conversation with ourselves as well as with other people to have the fullness of the gospel pressed into our minds and hearts so we can see real, radical heart and mind change so that the actions would follow. It's far too often we think, do the actions first so you can get the acceptance of God. But the word tells us something totally different. Because you have the acceptance of God, then therefore that's why we can go and do this. See, we've got it totally backwards. We put it in this little religious box. So in order to have this heart change, we need to be given the reason. We need a, a reason that will melt our hearts, change our desires, change our, our wants, the affection. So here's a, here's a couple examples I might give you guys. An employee, an employee will work harder and with a better attitude when they're working for a, a boss that they really, that they love. The, the guy just treats him well, there's confidence in this, that, that employee will work harder. Or if they work for a company that they believe in the vision or mission of the company, uh, they'll, they'll work harder and with joy, won't they? But if, but if they are unsure, 
If they're not sure, or if maybe the boss treats them bad or whatever, then, then they're just going to be a little apathetic. They're not going to have a desire and passion to work for this guy. Or with your kids, with parenting, when your kids are convinced that you love them, and that when you tell them, I don't want you to go do this or do that because it's going to hurt you, when they're convinced that you're saying that because they love you, there's a much greater chance. Now, kids are still kids, and we still are sinful people, and we still, our curiosity gets the best of us, but a much greater chance that a kid, if they're convinced that their parents are really looking out for them and aren't just joy killers, but if they're convinced that mom and dad are trustworthy, they care, they're, they're, they're smart, they're wise, they love me, much greater chance that they're gonna think twice before going and doing that thing. But if they're suspicious and think that you're just doing it just to do it and they don't understand the reason why, then their curiosity probably is gonna get the best of them. They're gonna go do that thing. Right, and so when we are convinced of why we should do this work or not do this thing or stay away from this or that, when we're convinced of why and particularly convinced of the character and nature of the person who is giving us the command, then it makes us, it changes our heart. The, the kids, they want to please mom and dad. They want mom and dad to be happy and they know it'll make them happy if they make mom and dad happy. The, the employee wants to make the boss proud because the employee loves working for the boss. It's just like when Jesus said, the, the parable, he said, enter into the joy of your master. You, we, we do the work of God with God and we get to enter into the joy of the master. The kids enter into the joy of the parents. These are, these are different ways that when, when we, we know and we believe in the person in particular that is giving us certain directives or whatever, once we believe the reason why and we believe that the character and nature of the person, our hearts change, things change, our desires change. But if we doubt God, if we doubt him, we doubt his plan, his desire, his, his will, we're more apt to just be apathetic. We're more apt to uh, be depressed. We're more apt to just not care. We're more apt to sin. And we're more apt to have no joy. Because we're gonna be more apt to go after things that we think will bring us joy and happiness, but really actually won't. But if we're convinced, and we don't doubt God, we don't doubt his desire for us, his desire for us to be filled with joy, if we're convinced that God is a joyful God and wants his children to be joyful, if we're convinced of that, then we will desire to follow his commands. Our hearts will change, and we'll see things more clearly and say, this is bad, this is the Lord, and so I'm gonna go do this. So we have to ask the question, why and how? Not just a command, don't look at that, don't do that, don't kill, don't rape, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. We can't just say, okay, we have to say, but why and how? How do we not do that? Why should we not do that? And so, as we go through life, we ask the question, why and how? This is where preaching the gospel to ourselves comes into play. And this is kind of a form of prayer, preaching the gospel to yourself, uh, it's different than just a, a typical prayer where maybe you go and you ask the Lord for certain things that you have need for. Because uh, here's the thing. Let's say you have a particular temptation. Oftentimes, we go into a time of prayer just asking God to give us strength over the temptation. And that's not a bad prayer. But there is a more effective way to pray that prayer that first results in heart change so that when you ask, your heart is now ready to receive the strength from the Lord to resist that temptation. Rather than just asking God point blank, now we're actually uh, preaching the gospel to ourselves so that our hearts are even prepared for the thing that we ask for. So uh, the old uh, saints in the past, uh, they call this soliloquy. It's a, it's a form of self-talk, preaching to yourself. We see this in the scriptures. I'll have a couple examples here. But what we, when we talk about this talking almost to yourself, preaching to yourself, reminding yourself of the goodness of God, of the, the gospel of Jesus. This is a form of prayer that is very important for us to have heart change. Now, in your notes, um, something I think is important for us to understand uh, is what I have in there called indicatives and imperatives. Now, those are some, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, kind of big words for something that's really important. I hope that you start seeing indicatives and imperatives in the word of God from this day forward. If you haven't already, I hope that you start seeing these more. Uh, more easily remembered is in your notes as because and therefore. Okay, so indicative is the because. Because this is indicative of God, because this is indicative of the gospel, then therefore, here's the imperative, here's the command. An imperative is a command. So because God is this way, because the gospel is this, because this is the truth, that's the indicative, then therefore, here's what we should do in response to it. Because and therefore. Far too often when we are talking to ourselves or talking to each other, we only tell ourselves the therefore. Why are you so stupid? Stop doing that. Why do you keep doing that? You just need to dot, dot, dot. Just a bunch of therefore. It's just a bunch of law. So in some ways, and I don't want to make this a clean delineation, but in some ways, the because and the indicatives is kind of like the good news, the gospel, and then the, the imperatives and the therefores is sort of like the commands, the law. So, but far too often we just have la, 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 la. That was like a little song I just sang. <laughs> but we need the good news that changes our hearts so that we can obey, so that we even want to obey the imperatives. If we just go after imperatives, then we're just going after with our own self-righteousness, our own self-strength, and we're gonna fail. So we need both. We need the because and the therefore. And you see this all over scripture. We're gonna see a few here. I wanna, I wanna have some examples here in your notes. Because I want, I want this to be very practical. I'm hoping that as we go through this, it becomes very practical to kind of give you a head start on your own particular weaknesses. Things that you constantly face, whether it's fear or depression or anxiety or self-image, certain temptations, it's gonna be on you to figure out what weaknesses you have and it's gonna be on you to figure out what gospel promises you need to learn to preach to yourself on a regular basis because you're different than me. You need different promises than I do. And a lot of them we're gonna need the same because we're all very similar too. So I have some examples that I hope will kind of give you a, a picture of how this works. So uh, the first one here, fear. If you're battling fear, this is a great verse to preach the gospel to yourself, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 41.10, this one is amazing for fear. It says, fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. Be not dismayed, don't be amazed, I, I, I'm, I'm your God. Don't be amazed, I'm, I'm with you, don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged, I'm with you, I'm your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you, <coughs> excuse me, with my righteous right hand. Now, I'll break these down a little bit because I want you to see how these verses you can use to preach the gospel to yourself when you are afraid of something. Okay, let's look at uh, Isaiah 41.10. There's a command there, isn't there? What's the command? Fear not, don't be dismayed. Now, now imagine just that phrase, right? You've got this thing that's impending in your life and you've got a lot of fear and you just tell yourself, okay, Joby, just don't be afraid, don't be afraid, okay? Just, you just, this fear is just, it's, it's stupid, it's foolish, just, just have courage, believe in yourself, Joby, just fear not, don't be dismayed. Think about that, how much is that gonna help me? It's not gonna help me at all because when that thing comes upon my life and this thing looms over my life and the shadow of these events, whether it's sickness or joblessness or money or whatever, and you just tell yourself, Joby, why are you being so foolish? Just don't be afraid of this. You're bigger than this. That's just, that's just the law, that's just self-righteousness, that's worthless. But it's a command in the Bible, Joby. You should just, just do it. You just need to fear not, Joby. You just need to not be afraid. You just need to trust God. You just need to not be dismayed, and that's it. That's worthless to me, church, because that's out of context, isn't it? That's not the whole story. I need the because. Why should I not be afraid? Because look what Psalm 27 says. The Lord is my light. He's my salvation. I'm not my salvation. So when sickness or death is upon me, or the fear of losing a job or losing a friendship. 
I'm not the one to save me out of this problem. God is my salvation. He's my light. He will uphold me with his righteous right hand. I am not going to uphold myself through my circumstances. I do not have the strength to do so. So when I am in fear, I have to say, because God, you are with me. Because you will uphold me with your righteous right hand. Because you are the light and my salvation. I have nothing and no one that I should fear. I cannot be dismayed because you are my salvation. See how that works? Not just the, you just need to do this. Because of this, then therefore, now, I don't have to be afraid. That's markedly different, isn't it? Markedly different. The next example, anxiety over provision. Matthew 6, verse 25. I'm just gonna read a few and kind of skip through some of this. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. Okay, there's a command. There's an imperative. Just don't be anxious. Thanks, Jesus. (laughs) But he doesn't stop there, does he? He doesn't just tell us what to do. He keeps going. He gives us the because. So it's not always in the order, because and therefore, but it's always going to be there somewhere. So that's the imperative. He says, there, I mean, look at He says, therefore, he actually uses the word we just said. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. What you eat, what you drink, nor about your body, don't worry about it. But, but isn't that worthless on its own? Jesus just saying, just don't worry about it. Like, okay, then what do I do? But then he says, the because part, isn't life more than food, the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you of more value than them? So now think about this prayer. It's not just, oh, Joby, don't be anxious. And it's also not just, God, help me not be anxious. And that's not a bad prayer, but it's more than just asking God to help you not be anxious. You preach the gospels to yourself first, and then you ask God to help you do the imperative, the therefore. You say, God, I don't want to be anxious. I know it's sinful for me to worry and think I'm in control. And so, God, I just I want to remind myself and have your word in my heart remind me that you clothe the birds. You clothe the flowers and you care about me more than them. So God, because of that, help me now to believe that so that I'm not anxious about tomorrow. Now that's, that's a prayer that is first gonna start melting your heart so that you can obey, don't be anxious. But if you just go straight into the command, you're gonna, you're just, your flesh is gonna be battling that. See, we need the renewal of our mind first so that we can actually believe and then obey the command part, the imperative part. And so he goes down a few, go to verse 33. Instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek out the gospel of truth. Seek out who God is, and all these things will be added, (coughs) excuse me, to you. Therefore, don't be anxious. So he says, right, because, because, We seek out the Lord and his righteousness and we know that God clothes the birds and the flowers and therefore don't be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Another example, condemnation over sin or self-hatred. You know, you have those sins that you just can't seem to beat. For many of us, we have the same ones. For many of us, we have different ones. But you keep going back to that same pattern, that same sin, and every time you do it, you beat yourself up. You feel like a second-rate citizen in the kingdom of God. You think like you're not really a son or daughter. You feel like you're an illegitimate child of God. You think that God is disappointed with you. You think that he's about to unadopt you or give you back or that he uh, is just so angry at you. I think probably everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about. So we have this condemnation over sin. What do we do? How do we respond? Do you just say, ah, why'd you do that again? You just, you just need to stop doing that, Joby. You just need to stop. Just don't do that again. Right? We know that doesn't work. My Romans 8.1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. You need to remind yourself of that gospel truth. 
You're not going to want to believe it at the time because of what you just did, but you need to believe. You need to have that preached so that your mind is transformed. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Remind yourself of this, Paul says to the church. He speaks of various different types of sin, partiers, drunks, homosexuals, uh, thieves. And he says, and you guys, such were some of you. You were like that too. But, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You need to remind yourself when you are condemning yourself, remind yourself that God is not condemning you. And you hold no power in the court of God's law. So you can condemn yourself all you want. It's not gonna actually change your status with God. And so you need to remind yourself because there is no condemnation in Christ, because you've been washed and sanctified and justified, then therefore, you don't need to condemn yourself because God doesn't. Jesus took all that on. Another one, temptation for sin. So this is more before you do some of these things, before you worry, before you sin. How, how do you prevent? Because some of this is this preaching the gospel to yourself stuff. Some of this is gonna be reactionary to sin you commit or feelings you already have. But another part of preaching the gospel to yourself is also preventative for things that you're tempted to do. So you gotta get to know yourself and you gotta have other people help you get to know yourself because you, know, you got blind spots that you don't even know are there. That's why we call them blind spots. So you need friends to tell you what those blind spots are so that you can know what type of gospel promises you need to learn how to preach yourself, not just uh, in a reactionary way, but also in a preventative way. So when you're tempted to sin, you're battling, your flesh wants this thing, you want revenge, you want to gossip, you wanna defend yourself, whatever it might be. Here's one, Proverbs 14, 12. It says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. So when you're tempted to gossip, when you're tempted to say this thing, you, you pray and you say, God, because I know that this is against your desire and your will to gossip, I know that's, really, that's gonna bring some kind of death. It's gonna bring death of a relationship, death of trust, death of my representation of you because I'm gonna lose integrity as a gossiper because this is gonna draw me away from life and you and it's gonna, because it's gonna bring me towards death of something and therefore I wanna run from this. Therefore God help me to be, believe that this is the way of death and life is keeping my mouth shut Life is not looking at that thing. Hebrews 3.13 says, take care, brothers. So this is speaking to believers. And this is what's important here, because I think this ties in even with a little bit of Romans 12 here. Take care, brothers, Christians, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. So what that tells us that even brothers and sisters, Christians, there's parts of our hearts, the flesh, that still needs some change. We still need some transformation of the mind. There's dark parts of our, our heart, our being, our, 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 our character that needs transformation. So he says, take care so that there wouldn't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Though we are renewed in the spirit, we still live in a body of flesh. So there's still unbelieving parts of our hearts and mind that need to be converted and so that we would be transformed and believe the true gospel. So if we have this parts of our heart that are unbelieving still, they will lead us to fall away from the living God. The way is the end of death. Not eternal death, separation from God, but leaving the fellowship of God. But instead, exhort one another, encourage each other each and every day, as long as it's called today, so that, here's why, none of you would be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness that sin will bring you down to the way of death. So we say, because God, because sin deceives me, I know God, that sin deceives me into falling away from life and breaking communion with you, then therefore, I wanna confess my sin and my temptation to other people that will help me. Therefore, uh, I'm gonna uh, open up and be vulnerable with people and let them in on my temptations because I don't wanna follow the way that seems right to me. 
So we say, because then, Lord, that is the way of death, and therefore, help me have the humility to confess my sin, the imperative, confess your sin to one another. Why? Because sin is deceitful and will lead you towards death. It'll lead you away from God. Because and therefore. Depression. Psalm 42, verse 5. Eric mentioned this one last week, and this is a perfect example of soliloquy, preaching the gospel to yourself. This is David preaching to himself. He is actually talking to himself here in the form of a song, in the form of a prayer. He says, why are you cast down? Who's he talking to? Oh, my soul. It's me, close my eyes, going, Joby, why are you feeling this way right now? It's me praying, sitting before the Lord, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking to myself, even though it's this prayer and time in God's presence where I'm going, God, I'm here with you, and I just, I need to preach to myself. And I gotta ask myself, why, why am I so discouraged that I just sinned? How come I'm condemning myself for this sin, even though I know that there's no condemnation? Uh, <coughs> why am I so downtrodden? Why am I so discouraged? Why am I so depressed? And why are you, Joby, in turmoil within me? Why are you, my soul, in turmoil? What, what is wrong? What, what am I believing that is wrong? And then here's another imperative that David says himself. He, David is telling himself, he's preaching himself, David, hope in God. Don't hope in yourself or your circumstances. He's saying, hope in God, David. Oh, my soul, turn your mind to God. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, now he's changing it to the Lord. I remember you. He, he says, why am I cast down? I have to hope in God. How do I hope in God? I know how to hope in God. I know how to obey this imperative that I'm just, I'm, I'm commanding myself. Just got to hope in God. How? Oh, I know how. I think about God. I remember God. I preach to myself about God or I remind myself about the goodness of God. That's what's going to bring my soul out of this downtrodden state. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you. I'm depressed, I'm, I'm looking at life, I'm looking at all these things, so what do I need to do? I need to hope in the gospel. I need to remind myself and remember the gospel. Now this one's interesting. He says, from the land of Jordan and the end of uh, Hermon, uh, some of your Bibles might say the Hermonites, it t- talks about a mountain range from Mount Mazar. This is uh, it's a land beyond the Jordan, away from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, as you guys know, was uh, really a picture. This is Mount Zion. This is the, the dwelling place of God. And what David's saying, I, I'm, I'm in exile right now. I'm, I'm far from the Lord right now. I'm in this other place. And Mount Mazar, that actually means uh, smallness. So, it's, so it seems like David's even saying, like, I'm on this small little mountain, way apart from the presence of God. I'm away from the glorious Mount Zion. And I'm just hanging out on this little tiny hill in this place of depression, separate from you, but from this place even, where I'm downcast and separate from the glory of God at Mount Zion in Jerusalem, from this place, I will remember God. In this place of depression and and this feeling of separation and breaking of communion, I've I've sinned against God and all these things have happened and and I'm just, I'm downcast in my life, but even though I'm separate from the feeling and and the, the tangible presence of God, but from this place even, I will remember God so that I will not be downcast any longer. God will bring me out of this pit of despair even if I'm from this distance because I just will remember God. I'm gonna preach to myself the good news of the gospel of God's joy and happiness and gladness of heart. Church, the way to forget our miseries in life is to recall the God of mercy, to recall the God of grace. This is what causes these, uh, the fear of circumstance. It doesn't make your circumstances disappear, but it causes the worry and, and the fear of circumstances uh, at least, maybe not totally disappear, but at least fit in proper perspective. Another one, worry. 
Philippians 4, 4 through 9. A command, an imperative. Paul says to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. That's a command. He commands the church to rejoice, to have joy in God. And he says again, I'm going to tell you guys again. I'm going to repeat myself here. Rejoice. Be glad. Okay, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Here comes the because part. Church, the Lord is at hand. He's not far from you. He's near the brokenhearted. He is right there at hand. You have a God who is not distant. Even if you're on the other side of the Jordan, far from Mount Zion, he is at hand. You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to worry because your God is always at hand. So therefore, rejoice in the Lord because the Lord is at hand. So don't be anxious about anything. Another command. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers, whatever's true, okay, here's the because part, mixed in with some therefore. Whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about those things. Remind yourself of those things. Now, I'll tell you one thing that definitely is described by all those words, something that is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, and excellent and worthy of praise, that's the gospel. It's the love of your Savior. And so, because the gospel, because Jesus is true, because his promises are true, because his promises, and because he is honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable, because the gospel is excellent and worthy of praise, then think about those things. Preach to yourself those things. Remind yourself of the goodness and loveliness and purity of the gospel and God's love towards you in Jesus Christ. And if you do this, if you practice those things, if you practice that reminding of those things into your mind, guess what happens? It says at the very end here, the God of peace will be with you. Because of all that, then therefore I can rejoice in the Lord and God's peace will be with me. One more here, being unsure of the future. You have fear of the future. Matt read this during worship this morning, Romans 8, 28. You fear the future and you remind yourself all things are gonna work together for those who love Jesus. 1 Peter 5 Verse six, humble yourself. There's the command. Humble yourself, therefore. That's the command. Under the mighty hand of God. And so here's why. So that at the proper time, he'll exalt you, casting your cares, casting all your anxieties on him. There's the command. Cast your worry upon him, church. Why? How? Because, the actual word because. We have actually the word because and therefore in these two verses. First Peter five, six, and seven because he cares for you. And so now, if you have unsureness of the future, a a way you would practically put this in your prayer, say, you don't just say, God, I wanna cast my cares upon you, help me to do that, that's an okay prayer, but you should start with a because. God, because you care for me. And you can work in the other verses, you can work in because you clothe the birds and the flowers, because you care for me, then therefore I can humble myself under your mighty right hand and I can also now trust in you because I know that you care for me. But you, you gotta be convinced first that God really actually cares for you if you're really gonna trust him, right? You're not gonna entrust yourself to someone you don't really believe cares for you. So you gotta first believe the because part so that you can do the therefore part. We need the transformation of the mind. We need the renewal of the mind first so that we can obey. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Remind yourself of that. God, you're gonna make everything beautiful in your time. I don't have to fear the future. Also, Ecclesiastes says, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that man cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. You can say, God, I'm not gonna figure you out. I'm not gonna figure out your ways, but I know that you're gonna make everything beautiful in your time. So because of that, and therefore, I can trust you with my future, even though there's some scary things in it. 
You need the transformation of the mind first before you can obey. So as we close up here, <coughs> uh, in your notes, it says this, that with all the messages we preach to ourselves, true joy, true happiness doesn't come natural. It just doesn't, church. We gotta discipline ourselves like an athlete, putting in the work and building muscle memory. So this is second nature to us, to go to the gospel when these things happen. To where preaching truth to yourself becomes more and more like second nature. We need to memorize scripture that directly relates to our weaknesses and needs. This, this stuff takes time. It takes a lot of practice. It, it takes the renewal of the mind that only the Lord can do. This is why we're starting to memorize scripture as a church. And this is why if, if it's some of these things, you know, fear or maybe it's bitterness or ungratefulness or complaining or gossip, whatever it is, your weakness, you gotta find verses that give you some because and therefores. And part of our joy project uh, that in the coming weeks we'll start building some more things up on the website. We'll have uh, some of these gospel because and therefore promises that you can go with different categories and stuff so you can basically just have a little roadmap, a little plan, so if you just wanna start memorizing certain scriptures that really just go to your particular needs, you've got a place that you can start and start taking every thought captive, discerning, is this a lie that I'm believing? Is this a different gospel or is this the truth? Because you gotta remember this too, is that oftentimes, uh, even what you preach to yourself, oh, you're such a failure, oh, you always do this, oh, you always do that, a lot of times those things that are preached to us, there's, there's some truth in it, right? There's certain things that are true. You do fail. You do mess up. You do sometimes screw up relationships. There are things that are true about you, but we have to understand and believe what is truth. Okay, I, here's a great quote. Uh, this is from Martin Luther. I, I love this quote. He says, when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, or in your, our case, maybe sometimes you say, oh, you're such a failure of those things. You say this to him, yes, you're right. I admit that I deserve death and I admit I'm a failure. I admit I did this, I did that, I did all those things. I admit it, but what of it? So what? I know one, capital O one, I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, he's the son of God and where he is, there I shall be also. Luther basically says, Devil, you're right. Self, you're right. I'm a failure, but you know what? If you're gonna get to me, you gotta go through Jesus. Where he is, that's where I stand. And so there's, there's gonna be some true things about you and your failures and temptations and things like that, but, but preaching the gospel doesn't just make those things go away, it just puts them in the proper perspective and worldview so you understand what is the foundation of your faith. That's what preaching the gospel does, changing our mind and our perspective. So let's pray now and thank the Lord for these uh, great truths. And I wanna pray that as we do this, that this preaching the gospel itself, this would not be about avoiding or pretending. Uh, it wouldn't be some kind of uh, power of positive thinking, some naive thought process. This is not what preaching the gospel to yourself is all about. This is about having the, the biblical worldview to put your circumstances and the realities of life in proper perspective, having our heart changed that we know, and as Romans 12 says, that we can discern what is the will of God when all these things come to us. Father, we thank you that your gospel is true. It is trustworthy. It is commendable. It is reliable. It is unshakable. That preaching the gospel to ourselves is about bringing this unshakable, unchangeable, sure promises of your word into the forefront of our minds. In order to change our hearts, to change the affections of our hearts, the desires of our hearts, that we would delight ourselves in you, the Lord, so that you would then bring us the desires of our hearts. New desires, changed desires when our minds are transformed. Bringing about a deep faith and trust 
that gets us through every single challenge, every single battle that we face. It doesn't make them go away, but it helps us to trust you in them. It helps us to not have fear as we face them and trusting ourselves to you, casting our anxieties upon you. So help us, O oh Lord, to find gospel promises that we can arm ourselves with, that we can press into our minds. As your word says in Psalm 119, verse nine and 10, that we would store up the words in our minds so that we wouldn't sin against you. That means we've gotta memorize gospel promises so that when we find ourselves in temptation or maybe on the other side of sin, we know how we can run to our advocate, your son Jesus. We run to the gospel of, as your word says, the gospel of happiness and good news and peace. To help us, Lord, to believe that this, uh, this, this discipline of learning how to preach the gospel to ourselves, that this would lead us to the joy of your salvation. The gladness, the happiness of our master, that we would share in the joy that you have towards us. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much. And it is in your son's mighty and precious and joyful name that we pray. Amen.